Max, you're never gonna believe it. <gasps> We're going on a trip! Really? Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and master educator attempting to provide you with the best in art historical content. If you like the video, like, share, subscribe. Thank you. What's the problem, officer? Today, we're in Minneapolis at the Art Institute. We're going to jump inside and take a look at 11 great artworks that you can find inside this great collection. Let's jump in and take a look. The Minneapolis Institute of Art has a great collection of art. There's some 90,000 works that span nearly 5,000 years of time. And keep in mind, the work that's out for consumption is always going to revolve, but there's always great things to see regardless. My grasp on sanity remains absolute. Isn't that right, Agent Stone? Heading up to the second floor, I saw this huge collection of Asian work. Now there are some really, really great pieces as I go through the exhibit, but this pair of guardian lions from the 8th century really caught my attention. They were carved out of limestone, and there's also a pair of these guardian lions at the very, very front of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, so I thought it would be kind of cool to bring it up with this pair that's also in the collection. Lions are not native to China at all, but they are a Buddhist tradition that was brought in from India along the Silk Road, and they would adopt the Indian practice of using lions to symbolize the Buddha Shakyamuni. The power and strength of the lion led to this becoming a very powerful symbol of a protector of the Buddha, and their temples, their laws, their altars, their tombs, and we oftentimes see them in doorways, again as protectors. And this very animated pair is a great example of a Chinese spin off of an Indian symbol. Boy, that escalated quickly. Daikodu Miao, the wisdom king of awe-inspiring power, is this Japanese sculpture made of wood with metal gilding and crystals and all kinds of things going on here. It's an absolutely impressive and intimidating carving. To merely note it as a carving is almost an understatement to what it is, as you can see. And the job of this sculpture was to be there to frighten and defeat evil. This Buddhist guardian deity has this intense rage. We see that on the expression of their face. Sprouting out from the body are six legs and six arms that each carry an assortment of weapons, and there are six glaring faces that defend from all angles as well as this halo of flames. And as you approach this thing, wow, how great is the woodworking and the carving, the artistry that we see in this absolutely impressive piece of work from Japan. Clearly, you've never been to Singapore. The Minneapolis Institute of Art has several rooms that are dedicated to art of Africa. And back in college, I took a couple classes on the arts of Africa, and I have always been drawn to figures like this. And so, including one in Art 101 is absolutely a treat. This particular example was made by an artist from the Congo. To the creators of this, this is not just a sculpture, but this is a container, a container of a spirit. This would have been a figure that would have been consulted in traditions of resolving disputes and arriving at solid decisions. When the nail is placed into this figure, it adds to its power. It represents a resolution to a problem. And for every problem that's resolved, it gains more and more power. The cowrie shells symbolize wealth, and the mirror acts as a reflector to the realm of the spirits, who are again believed to inhibit this particular sculpture. Truly a powerful piece, and it's great to be able to talk about it here for you. Yes, sir. 
there are many examples of important artifacts and things like that as you go through the display of artworks and objects from the Americas. And one that really caught my eye is not an ancient piece, but created by artist Norman Akers, an artist that created this piece in 2019 called Interference and a Tiny Spot of Hope. This to Akers represents the past, present, and future of his people. He's showing personal yet historic and cultural situations that he and the Osage native group face on a daily basis. It's very metaphorical, however, he's very much presenting the facts as he sees them. The elk falls between a world of his native people and a world of a modern advancement of clear-cutting trees and fencing in cattle and things like that. And one thing that I really appreciate about the experience here at the Minneapolis Institute of Art is that they place old historic objects and things like that, but also alongside those pieces, more contemporary works of art so that the old and the new really kind of come together to tell a more complete story. And this work by Mr. Akers also represents that more total storytelling in my mind anyway. What is that? One of life's mysteries, sir. There's a unique little collection of ancient works that they have here, and one that really caught my eye right away is this fragment of a mosaic floor, including this elephant attacking a tiger. Now, we have no idea what the entire thing looked like, but it is said that this is a part of a mosaic floor that was in a church in Antioch, now modern-day Turkey. Now, this Byzantine church would have likely had many different animals included in it, as was fairly common, and it would have been really spectacular to see all of the different animals and the interplay between them on the entire floor, but it is also pretty cool to be able to see this little panel of work here that would have been created somewhere in the 4th or 5th century out of little marble tiles. That's correct. Speaking of churches, the Duomo in Florence is one of the great ones, and this painting by Oscar Kakashka illustrating the Duomo of Florence that he painted in 1948 was definitely a piece that caught my eye in the modern and contemporary section of the museum. During World War II, Kakashka was labeled as a degenerate artist, but after the war, he was able to travel Europe and the United States painting all over the place. In a typical Kakashka fashion, he creates not just the typical red, white, and green of the actual Duomo, but an absolute explosion of color. And as a side note, as mentioned, he traveled to the United States, and one of his stops in the United States was actually the state of Minnesota, where he was an art instructor at the Minneapolis School of Fine Art. I never saw the teachers as like these untouchable authorities. Wow. I'd be like, listen. The museum also has an extensive collection of art from Europe and America from 1600 to 1900. And one of the great pieces that really falls in that zone is this painting by Camilla Pizarro one of the great masters of French Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. He was the wise gentleman, he was the glue that held it together for so many aspiring artists, and he is the only artist to actually participate in all eight of the Impressionist exhibitions from 1874 to 1886. You can see the brushwork and the details that he puts in there, the pops of color and how he lays those colors one next to the other. It's really, really great to be able to intimately see these works. And this video or looking at it in the textbook does not do it justice. You gotta come out, you gotta take a look at these pieces firsthand because seeing a Pizarro in a reprint is nothing like seeing the real thing face to canvas. Uh, ooh, Keith, ha, ha, ha. And I thought my jokes were bad. Now throughout the museum there are all kinds of little rooms and coves and crannies and things like that to see and one of the little rooms that I popped into is this little room of drawings and prints and these woodcut prints by Albert Durr really popped out at me in particular the martyrdom of St. John from 1498 
during his time becoming one of the, if not the greatest printmaker of all time, Albrecht Dürer would develop some amazing skills with woodcut. We can see his intricate line work in this particular printing of a illustration project that he was working on called The Apocalypse of St. John, the Book of Revelation. In this text, he would portray John's martyrdom. This is an individual that was condemned by the Roman Emperor after refusing to denounce his Christian faith. The depiction shows him placed into a cauldron where he is doused with boiling oil all over his body. In this we see the emperor dressed as a Turkish sultan as a symbol of his hostility towards Christianity. And obviously the work portrays a very powerful scene, something that would have been important to Durr to really, really communicate well to others, especially in this illustrated text. Shut up, you! Sorry! Looking at the collection of European art from 1200 to 1600, there is an inclusion by Hans Schnatterpeck, an Austrian artist that would create this Lamentation of Christ somewhere in the 1490s. We see the depiction of this lifeless Jesus Christ who's just been taken off the cross after his crucifixion. Around his dead body we see John the Evangelist holding his head, Mary Magdalene holding an ointment jar as his body lays across his mother Mary's lap. This late Gothic wood sculpture is truly an amazing example of the work that they were doing because usually Gothic sculpture isn't seen as being that great, but this is really an exquisite example of it. Is that story true, Grandpa? So as I'm walking down one of the corridors, I spot this work, the Winged Genius, made out of limestone, carved back around 859 BCE. And this is a low-relief carving taken from a palace of Nimrud in the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And this work decorated the palace of Asher Nasserful II, and it depicts the genius or demigod and it's completely packed with cuneiform text that talks about the greatness of Ashurnasaphil II and various military victories, and it also describes the palace itself. Originally, this would have been painted. That paint has all but eroded off. And when the palace was being excavated, all of the pieces and parts had kind of scattered in the wind. But this work, this individual depicted, would have been someone of great importance back in the day. Everyone just wants to feel important in life. Thing is, no matter how important they are, there's always going to be someone more important. People get so uptight about that. Oh no, they're better than me. It's like, God, they don't realize. Important. And the 11th and final piece that we're going to examine is really kind of a great one. This is the figure of Lar, painted back in the 1st or 2nd century in the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. Now, we've talked about Pompeii before and how it was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. You can go check out the content on that as well as other videos in the Art 101 library. But this particular fresco painting was created in a household as a part of a shrine. Lar was a god of health and prosperity and also oversaw family welfare, which is why this would have been an appropriate depiction for a family shrine of sorts. We see him pouring wine into a riton, which was used to aerate wine back in those days, and it arcs over his head and falls into a bucket and there would have been another image on the other side flanking this in this area of the Pompeii home where they would have had an altar for their family and such. This is a very interesting and unique piece in that it is literally a piece of Pompeii and really a great example of their fresco work. Hey, what do I know? I color for a living, but I love bringing you that sort of content. If you like it, make sure you like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. You have yourself a good day.